my name is Jonathan Sweetek, attorney with the Shannon Law Group. And this is uh, the February 10th webinar, a vaccine injury petitions journey through the vaccine injury compensation program. I'm going to talk a little bit about what happens to your petition after it gets filed all the way through resolution of the case. Um, unfortunately, Rhonda, our, our other attorney, is not going to be able to, to join us today, so you're stuck with me uh, for the whole time, but I'll make sure to get through this um, as quickly and efficiently as possible. And if you have any questions, please um, use the, the chat function um, in Zoom. And we're going to have uh, Brittany from our office monitoring the chat, and uh, she will notify um, notify me uh, when there's some questions. Uh, I will designate some time at the end of this uh, to answer any of those questions um, that you guys have. So I'm gonna share my screen now. Uh, and hopefully everybody can see this. So this is a little PowerPoint presentation. We go through again um, what happens to your petition uh, after we file it. So first, um, we have to prepare the petition, and you know, this is what we refer to as our intake process. Um, it begins with with a consultation with me uh, that that Heather sets up, um, and I, I go through uh, you know your injury the the vaccine that you received your symptoms um your treatment to date and uh what i'm looking for is is you know all the markings of a, a vaccine injury that's that's on the vaccine injury table within the program so um i'm actually asking pointed questions during that that uh, consultation process um and if it's a, a case that we think is um, one that you know we can show or, or establish is part of this vaccine injury table, then we'll we'll start the process of signing that case out. Once we we begin that process and, and we get you know an, an attorney uh, client contract together, we then uh, move into you know preparing the petition and and what we need in order to prepare the petition is a, a list of all your medical providers, uh, some of your own account or your own testimony um, of your injury, what, what happened after the vaccination, and um, some other witness information if we need to kind of fill in some gaps where, where maybe the, the medical documentation is lacking. Uh, so that's, that's a really important part of this process to, to get all of that information, gather all of that information, um, because it, it, it goes into obtaining your medical records. It goes into preparing your affidavit for you to review and sign, and then ultimately drafting the petition based on, on all the evidence that we gather. So um, this is, a, like I said, a really important part of, of the process because what we like to do is have everything ready when it comes time to filing your petition, have all the evidence we need, have all the information we need uh, to move forward with your case. So um, once we gather uh, the, the medical records, uh, once we have the, uh, the, the affidavit from, from you and from any other witnesses that we want to include, we will uh, then draft the petition. And we, we try to do that by including specific citations to the medical records because they're they're very important when it comes to proving your case um, and obviously citations to to your own testimony in the affidavit so once we we have the the completed draft of the petition we'll go ahead and file that with the uh, u.s court of federal claims the clerk of the u.s court of federal claims and that's the only thing that we'll file in the beginning is, is, a, is a copy of your petition and a cover sheet, uh, including the, the, the type of vaccine that was administered and the date of that vaccine. Um, and that's for, for HHS, for the Department of Health and Human Services, that's for their own records, uh, because they like to keep track of which vaccines are, are, are uh, being alleged as causing injuries and, and, and when those vaccines are received. So 
the the petition, the way that we draft our petitions um, is either on a, a table case or an off table case basis. So what I mean by that is there's a vaccine injury table and it lists the injuries or conditions that are associated with particular vaccines. Now let's take Serva for an example because it's easily the most common, commonly alleged vaccine injury. And uh, it's, it's one that it can be caused by any vaccine that's on the list. So if you meet the criteria set forth in the vaccine injury table, we allege that this is a table case. Now we're going to prove a, a table case. Now, if for some reason the, the evidence in your case does, does not satisfy the criteria set forth in the table, then we would file that as an, an off table case. So the difference between those two things is a table case, if you can, if you can establish that criteria, then there's a presumption that the vaccine caused your injury. In an off table case, we, we don't get afforded that presumption. So we would have to prove uh, that in fact, the vaccine that you received caused your injury. So what we try to do is, is, is make sure we can prove table cases because uh, it's, a, it's a much easier path to compensation. So during, and that starts at the, the consultation process. You know, we're trying to, to make sure that we have enough evidence to establish the criteria set forth in the table. So nearly all of our petitions that we file are table cases, or at least alleged table cases. After we file the petition, the petition uh, goes into what they call the pre-assignment review process. You may hear me refer to this as the PAR process. Um, and this is a process where that, that is overseen by the chief special master. And he'll, he'll enter an initial order requiring us to file all the evidence in support of our petition, our, our allegation in the petition. So that includes pre-vaccination medical records. We need medical records going back three years prior to the vaccination that you received. Post-vaccination medical records, uh, and, and that includes medical documentation of treatment of at least six months past the, the vaccination date. That's a requirement uh, to, to entitlement, is that you have at least six months of treatment. An affidavit by the, the petitioner, the PAR medical history questionnaire, which is a list of your medical providers, and then any witness affidavits, which are, are optional, but we like to include those when we can, uh, especially if if we you know, anticipate any issues, um, whether there's gaps in, in treatment or delays in treatment, um, we will take steps to try and get those witness affidavits. Once you've filed all of the records that are required by the PAR process, you then file what's called a statement of completion. The statement of completion signals to the court, to the special master, that to the best of our knowledge, we've filed everything we need to file. The, the, the petition is now ready for the court's preliminary review. So at that point, we're still in the PAR process, but the, the court now takes control of the petition and they will start to review the case. So in the initial PAR order, uh, it, it states that the, the, the this pre-assignment review process, once we file a statement of completion, should take no longer than 60 days. Um, unfortunately, we haven't seen that in action. Um, due to you know, the, the backlog that the court is facing right now with, with petitions that have been filed, um, that process has been taking much longer than 60 days. Uh, and, and that's just, you know, what we have to deal with right now with, with the, the backlog that has, has uh, the court has been faced with. There is an option for us after 60 days to file a motion for assignment of your petition. Uh, that's what we're waiting for. We're waiting for the petition to be assigned out of the PAR process. Now, after 60 days, we can file that motion 
uh, and we have in a few cases, and, and uh, we haven't really seen that it has fast tracked uh, any of our petition. Um, so, although that's an option for us, and, and we're going to take advantage of that option when we can, um, as of right now, you know, we're seeing delays across the board during this process. So, eventually, at some point, whether it's within 60 days or after 60 days, your petition is going to be assigned out of the power process into the special processing unit or to a different special master. And we'll get into why a petition would be assigned to the SPU versus a, a special master in a second. Um, one thing that I want to mention here is during this court's preliminary review, um, they will identify if they believe we have records that are, are missing or incomplete, or uh, if there's some other issue that they want to resolve prior to reassigning your petition. So again, this goes back to the, to the beginning. It's, real, it's, it's crucial, it's critical that we get all your medical records up front, that we're not missing anything, because when we file all that stuff and we tell the court, we're, your petition's ready for review, um, we don't want the court to identify any other issues and send it back to us and say, we need this, we need that, because it only causes further delays. Then we have to go out, get those records, file an amended statement of completion, and then this whole process starts again. So it's very critical that at the beginning of this, of, of this process, we have all the information that we need. Here's a quick overview of where things would be. Um, we have the PAR process, assuming that uh, the court can conduct its initial review, it has all the information it needs. It will either assign your petition to the special processing unit or to a different special master. Now the special processing unit was created a few years ago and it's reserved for those cases that the court believes should resolve, um, whether that's through settlement or through the government conceding that you have experienced or, or suffered a vaccine injury. Um, again, just like I just explained with the, the table cases versus off table cases, our goal is to file table cases and our goal is to get to the special processing to get assigned there. Uh, because that tells us that there aren't any you know, identifiable issues, or at least from the court's perspective, that uh, you know, would prevent us from resolving the case. So assuming we get it assigned to the special processing unit, um, we'll go over what the next steps would be in that case uh, over the next few slides. If it's a case that's, that's an off-table case that uh, you know, would require us to prove in fact that the vaccine caused your injury, that's much more likely to be assigned to a, a different special master for that special master, that judge to oversee the process um, that goes into you know, proving your case. So there are instances where we would file a table case or, or try to allege a table case. And during the process of, of the court's review, they identify issues that they feel are more complicated for the special processing unit. And they would instead assign that to a special master or a judge to work through those issues. You know, that's something we, we're trying to avoid in all of our cases, um, but it does happen from time to time. So let's assume that we file a, a serva petition. Uh, we allege a table case. There are no issues that the court identifies that, that would require it it to assign it to a, to a different special master. So we get assigned to the special process. The chief ma special master keeps those cases. He oversees this special processing unit and he will enter scheduling orders um, accordingly. So the initial schedule, scheduling order will set a deadline for the respondent or the government to file their initial status report. And within that report, they need to tell us what their position is, how they intend to proceed with this case. Now, there's three different things that they could do at this point. They could 
basically kick the can down the road and say, we haven't completed our review yet. HHS has not completed its review, but we're willing to engage in settlement discussions at this point. They could uh, signal that they're most likely going to concede that this is a, a vaccine injury and want to discuss a proffer, which is extremely rare. Um, or they could signal that they're going to defend the case for some reason, whether they're going to dispute uh, that we haven't satisfied one of the criteria set forth on the table. Now, regardless of, of this position statement, the court will um, ask them to propose a deadline for themselves uh, for their own Rule 4 report. And a Rule 4 report is, their, is HHS's official uh, position. Now, when I was referring to this position statement, uh, earlier, this is kind of an unofficial position. This is how they intend to proceed. The Rule 4 report is a complete summary of the facts and specific detailed reasons, either why they're conceding that this is a vaccine injury or why they're disputing that this is a vaccine injury. Now, they get to propose their own deadline. And the, the, right now, the going rate for those deadlines is anywhere from 10 months to a year. And uh, that, that's after it's been assigned to the special processing unit. So as you can see, there's delays on the court's end, uh, getting your petition assigned to either the special processing unit or a special master. And then there's delays from the government's end uh, filing these rule four reports. And there's not much we can do on our end to speed up those processes. Now during, the, the special processing unit while, while we're there, uh, I mentioned that there's, there's opportunities to settle the case. Now, when a uh, respondent indicates that they're willing to discuss what they call litigative risks uh, settlements, what they mean is we're not going to um, concede that there's a vaccine injury here. Uh, we're, we're, we're disputing it but we're willing to discuss settlement. And although uh, it's, it's fun sometimes to talk about compensation, to talk about money, um, most of the time, uh, these are, are, are not fruitful discussions because the, the offers that we get on these cases are um, not representative of full value of the case. They're, they're significantly discounted um, at this stage. So, and that goes uh, especially for survey cases, unfortunately. Um, it's extremely rare, if not um, impossible to get a full value settlement offer at this stage uh, without HHS uh, completing its full review of your case. But uh, of course, if, if we get any kind of offer at any point during this process, we always discuss that with our clients. And we go through uh, you know, whether or not um, it would be our recommendation to accept the offer, you know, what risks there would be waiting, what risks there would be trying to um, go to hearing if there are disputes. Uh, so you know, every once in a while, there, there may be a case that uh, for whatever reason, there, there are issues with it. And you know, one of these settlements on a disputed basis becomes a real option. So, we will always discuss that with our clients. Now, the other possibility, which is you know very very rare, would be the uh, the respondent or the government wanting to discuss a, a full value settlement offer prior to HHS's full review or their their rule four report. Um, the way that that this is set up is we work with an attorney from the Department of Justice. That's who represents the Department of Health and Human Services. The Department of Justice attorney doesn't actually have any authority to settle cases. Now, they don't have authority to concede that there's a vaccine injury. That comes from the Department of Health and Human Services. So it, it's, it's very, very rare for, the, for the, the Department of Justice attorney to discuss a case in terms of full value or, or a concession until HHS has completed its review. That's just the way it works. 
And as I mentioned earlier, right now, HHS is asking for 10 months to a year to, to review these cases. I mentioned the Rule 4 report earlier, and uh, this is where HHS comes in. They will uh, assign a medical reviewer to review your petition. They review all the records that we file, and uh, they whether or not this uh, the evidence meets the criteria of the table, they will um, file this Rule 4 report. And the Rule 4 report, again, is a summary of, of all the facts of your case, or at least their interpretation of the facts, and uh, the, the basis for why they're conceding or disputing the case. Now, during this process, this is another opportunity for the respondent to identify any issues that may need uh, you know, fixing on our end. So if during the court's initial review, they miss some records or, 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 or miss some issue, the respondent has another chance here to, to identify those and ask that we either file additional records, supplemental records, or any other um, evidence or documentation which again would cause more delays. So it's very important that from, from the outset of your case, we have everything we need. Recently, the chief special master has uh, implemented what he likes to refer to as an unofficial one year deadline. Now, this is just for special processing unit cases. If after one year, uh, from the date that the case was assigned to the special processing unit, respondent has not filed its report and the, the parties are not engaging in any settlement negotiations, the court will invite us to file what's called a motion for ruling on the record. Now, a motion for ruling on the record is kind of a shortcut to a, a hearing in front of the judge. Usually we would have to wait for the respondent to indicate what his position is, whether it's a concession or a disputed case. This allows us to file a, a motion and uh, ask the court to rely just on the record, look at the petition, look at the affidavits, look at the medical records, and uh, rule on our case, rule on entitlement, tell us whether or not we're entitled to compensation. So, and, and this, is, uh, this is a welcome uh, shortcut. You know, this was something that um, we were excited about that the special master implemented because he, he could see that there were, there were too many delays from respondents end, uh, and he wanted to give us an option. You know, if we felt strongly, if we felt confident about our case, that we could use this to our advantage and, and file a motion. And then that way, we're not sitting around waiting and waiting for a respondent to, to tell us whether or not they're going to concede. So we will use this. Uh, when we, we feel confident, when we, when we want to um, just have the judge rule on it. You know, there is obviously a little bit of risk involved because, you know, if, if, there's, if respondent concedes, then there's no need for the judge to rule on anything. Then we just go into what amount of compensation are we talking about? Um, you know, if we ask the judge to rule on this, we're, we're, we're removing that possibility and we're asking him, we're putting it in his hands. Uh, and then there is an opportunity for him to, to, to deny compensation. But again, we, we were, would reserve this for, for those cases that we feel very strongly about. Now, if, if in its rule four report, the respondent concedes that there's a uh, vaccine injury here, then the court having received that report will file a decision uh, or a ruling regarding entitlement and, and, and enter a, a decision saying that the petitioner is entitled to compensation. If we haven't already submitted a settlement demand at that point, the court would instruct us to do so. And then from there, the uh, respondent would um, send over what they call a proffer. And a proffer is different from a settlement offer that I discussed earlier. A proffer is HHS's full value evaluation of our case, of the damages or the compensation in our case. So they'll, they'll review all the evidence. And again, if there's any other additional evidence that we want to submit prior to a proffer, 
you know, that goes to damages, um, we'll take advantage of that. So if there's, if there's updated treatment records, if there's additional affidavits that we want to file, anything to, to bolster our damages claim, we're, we're going to do that. Once we've done that, the respondent will, will send over a proffer. And unlike a settlement offer, there's no negotiation on this number. This is their best and final and first uh, offer on the case. So at that point, obviously, we'll discuss that number with our client. And if it's uh, something within the range that we would expect for your particular case, then we would discuss taking it. Um, if we felt that the, the offer was not representative of your case, of the facts of your case, um, you know, then we, would, we might recommend rejecting it. Now, if we reject the proffer, um, the next step would be to go to a hearing on damages. So something that unfortunately comes into play when we discuss a proffer versus uh, a rejection is deciding whether to accept the proffer sometimes involves a, a timing decision. Because if, if you wanted to reject the proffer, what happens is you're, you're delaying payment of your case, sometimes up to a year. If it's a case that, that requires a full damages hearing with testimony and uh, with additional records and the court reviewing that, um, the way that they're scheduling hearings right now <clears throat> is anywhere from six to, to 12 months out. And then from there, the court, having heard all the, the evidence, still has to issue his decision and his ruling, which can take additional time. <clears throat> so that's why, unfortunately, when we discuss proffers versus rejections, that's a factor that has to come into play. <clears throat> now, there's a potential shortcut called motions day. And this is reserved for SPU cases, and it's reserved for uh, typically uncomplicated you know, survey cases or, or, or other straightforward cases <clears throat> as far as damages is concerned. Motions day is just a day where uh, the judge or the special master will, will hear a bunch of um, arguments and, and uh, read a bunch of briefs on cases that he wants to resolve you know, quickly. So this is uh, you know something that we would definitely take advantage of if we had a very straightforward damages case that we wanted the, the judge to, to hear and we didn't want to ex just accept the proffer from responding. Unfortunately, you have to be invited to Motions Day. Uh, it's not just something that you can sign up for. Um, obviously, you can, you can ask the court and if your, your petition is, is appropriate for Motions Day, they'll schedule one. And Typically, it'll take two to three months to, to get in front of the judge on a motions day. But the benefit is that you get a decision that day on, on your damages case. And then the, the decision is, is entered, the judgment can be entered, and then we can you know, start the process of, of getting a check for you. So motions day versus you know, a full damages hearing, uh, if, if the case does not, is not complicated and, and we want a, a quick decision and we don't want to accept the proffer, motions day is the way to go. If we don't want to accept the proffer and, and we think that this is a complicated case, we need uh, experts to testify, we need you to testify, then the damages hearing would be the route that we want to go. Now for defended cases, um, again, we can go back to you know, assignment to the SPU versus assignment to a special master. Um, most of the time, if the case is, is disputed or it's going to be defended, um, that case might be reassigned to a special master and out of the SPU. Um, most of the time, you know, these cases are going to involve some kind of fact hearing if there's an onset issue. So for example, in a survey case, we're, we need to demonstrate that your pain started within 48 hours of the administration of the vaccine. Now, what tends to happen is that a lot of our clients will put off treatment for a while, whether it's a month, two months, three months, four months, 
they think it's something that they can manage with over-the-counter medications, exercises. And the first time they, they go to the doctor to report their symptoms is maybe five months down the road. Most of the time, the respondent's going to try to dispute that case and say that we haven't established that uh, your symptoms started within 48 hours. And uh, if the, the court is inclined, they will schedule a fact hearing. And in that case, we would have to have you testify, have other people testify um, about the onset of your symptoms and, and try to establish that 48 hour onset. Now, aside from fact hearings, there's also um, you know, causation disputes. And, and I use the term or, or the word often here because this is the, the case that kind of established what, what we need to prove in, in a causation in fact case. So if it's not a table case, if we have to prove that the vaccine caused your injury, uh, most likely that's gonna involve expert reports and it's gonna involve a, an entitlement hearing with testimony from both the experts from you and from the client um, in front of the special master. And the special master, after the entitlement hearing uh, concludes, will uh, you know, issue his decision on whether or not we've, we've proven our case. And then uh, obviously a ruling on entitlement would, would come after that. So the, the defendant cases, um, as you can see, you know, would, would uh, take a lot longer than a, a conceded case or an SPU case um, because there, there's hearings involved, uh, there's testimony involved, and, and most of the time we're going to have to rely on the judge to, to come to um, a conclusion or, or a decision on your case. And even after that, if, if, we, if we disagree with the judge's ruling, we have options to review that decision. You know, with the U.S. Court of Federal Claims or with the U.S. Court of Appeals. So, um, you know, this goes back to again the the beginning where you know during the consultation process we try to do our best to take those cases um, you know that we think we can avoid this whole process. Um, obviously, we feel very strongly about a case um, that you know may not be a table case. We will definitely take that, but we know what's what's ahead. Um, if we take you know, a server case and we want to try to prove it's on the table, this is what we're trying to avoid. So um, that's just a you know, quick rundown of, of you know, what happens to a case if it's conceded versus disputed. So uh, assuming uh, that we, we get to the point of resolution in your case, this is kind of the, the process that it takes. If, if we decide to accept the proffer, from the respondent. The special master will, will immediately enter a decision awarding compensation uh, in the amount of the proffer. The, the parties, both of us will file a joint stipulation that we're not going to review the decision of the judge. And then the special master files the judgment, the clerk records the judgment. And from there, the US Treasury would issue a check uh, to our client. And, Right now, it takes about 45 to 60 days for that check to come in. If there's a ruling awarding compensation, same similar process, the special master will file that decision. Assuming there's no review from respondent, um, special master will file a judgment after 30 days in favor of petitioner. The clerk will record the judgment. And again, the US Treasury will, will issue the check. So here's kind of a, a, a overview of the whole process. Um, and I, I tried to break this down between, you know, if, if we're looking at, at, at the top line here, uh, this is for, for cases in which there, there aren't really any disputes. Um, and we kind of go, go straight from filing the petition to the judgment. Um, we're looking at, you know, a one and a half to two year process. On the bottom line uh, would be if uh, there, there are issues in the case, during the case, that we either have to resolve um, ourselves or through the judge, uh, and that can take anywhere from two and a half to three years. So it, it really depends on, on 
the facts of your case and, and, and the legwork that we do prior to filing the petition. Um, but what we try to do is, is be closer on, to that top line, to be closer to one and a half to two years um, all in for this process. Obviously things come up and, and we, we, we do our best to address those as, as quickly as we can. Um, and, and some of it is out of our hands. You know, some of it we're just waiting for the respondent to do their job or for the government to do their job. Um, but, but this is kind of what you can expect going in. One other thing I wanted to mention um, during the intake process, as you can see, you know, I have a, a six to 12 month um, process there where if, if you call us and, and you're at two or three months since you, you're injured, what we tend to do is, is, is offer to, to sign you up with our firm, assuming everything else has is, is, is been met, all the other criteria are met, um, because we like to get a head start on things. So if uh, at, at, at a certain point, you, know, you reach five months, you're getting closer to six months of treatment for this injury, then we can really start the, the process of, of getting what we need. Um, obviously, you know, during those those months, those four, you know, three, two uh, months where uh, we're, we're waiting for you to get to that six month threshold, we're not really doing much on your case. We're not we're not requesting medical records yet, um, you know, unless you, you have no other treatment with that that doctor. Um, you know, we're we're starting the process of, of drafting some some petition um, and, and the affidavit, but. Until you reach six months, that's when you know the work really begins on the case. Um, so, just wanted to to include that in the timeline um, because when you sign up with us, if you haven't reached six months. There is that period, of, that waiting period before we really get working on it. Uh, so this is a, a general overview, overview, and and again, uh, um, this is all recorded, and we're gonna um, post it on our YouTube channel. So. If you want to revisit any of this information, um, you'll be able to. So here's a few things that um, our clients can do to help us, you know, kind of shorten this time timeline. Um, timely return intake forms with with all of your medical providers. Um, you know, this is something that you know is time consuming. I, I completely understand. It's it's it's. Uh, <laughs> Not exactly fun to go through and, and try and identify all these medical providers, all their addresses, and um, but again, it's critical that we we have all that information because we're taking on the responsibility of, of getting all of your medical records. Um, so we need to to know who we need to send those to, and um, you know that includes any doctors that you've seen for the three years prior to your vaccine, and no matter how irrelevant it may seem, you know, let, let us make that decision, whether we're going to you know, file those records or, or, or retrieve those records. Um, but we, the more information we have, the better. Uh, you can help by facilitating um, you know, your, your signature on, on HIPAA forms and other medical record authorization release forms. Uh, oftentimes, you know, we'll send a request out with our own HIPAA form and it will get rejected because the medical provider has their own form that they want us to use. So when that happens, you know, we, we try to get our, our client signatures on those as quickly as we can. So uh, the faster you can do that for us, the, the better. Um, the other thing obviously is, is would be to timely res to respond to emails and, and phone calls from us to uh, verify, you know, some of this information, verify your affidavit, um, so that we can timely file those. And then keep us updated um, as you, you know, treat for this injury, undergo diagnostic testing, or if you stop treatment with, with a particular medical provider. Any new medical providers you know, we need to know about so that we can go out and get those records. And then finally, um, you know, be forthcoming with us. You know, we're, we're your attorneys. All of this stuff is, is confidential. Um, but we, you know, we need to know all relevant information. So if you if you had a prior injury, uh, if you had a prior you know, shoulder injury, if, and it's a cervical case, obviously we need to know that information because um, it's it, it's going to come out somehow. 
you know, they're going to see a reference to it in the records. Um, and, and then we're going to have to go out and get all that treatment records. Um, be forthcoming with us if there's delays or, or, or gaps in your treatment. Um, you know, we have ways of addressing those things and, and we, can, we can address those things if we know about them and we can get the necessary witness affidavits that we need. Um, but during the intake process, you know, the more information we have and are armed with, the, the better, uh, the better off we'll be when it comes to filing the petition. Okay, um, that's uh, just kind of a brief uh, overview of, of how you know the petition would um, work its way through the program, um, and I you know I try to keep it pretty basic. Uh, obviously, there are, there are many issues that, that may come up during a case that we would work out with the special master or the other side. Um, but as far as what we have control over, you know, this is, this is how um, the case would, would make its way through. So um, I'm gonna look now for the questions and see if we have any here in the chat. Okay, so um, Barbara Bennett asks if, um, wondering how you yourself as a petitioner can see what records you have so I can make sure you have all of them all. So um, what, we, what we need to do at a certain point is send you a copy of what we call the, the PAR medical history questionnaire and get your signature on that. And on that form, we're going to list all the medical providers that, that we have and that we've filed. Um, so, you know, when you review that, make sure that it's, it's accurate and make sure that um, we're not missing anything. Uh, if we are missing something, then obviously let us know and we'll, we'll go out and get those records. But um, the other thing that, that uh, you know, we're, we're going to start doing now is, is we're going to, to um, call our clients right after six months of treatment and, and make sure that um, we have all the medical providers that, that we need. So, and trust me, I, I'm not afraid of, of talking on the phone. Um, I, I, I enjoy talking to, to all my clients and, and catching up with them. And, um, you know, I don't get to see you guys face to face. So, um, you know, call us if you've got information that you, that you think you want us to know um, or you have questions. Um, you know, I, I, I'm more than happy to talk to you on the phone and make sure that we have everything. Um, okay. Michelle Johnson asks, um, I don't know if my case is at the par point. <clears throat> so when we file the petition, we'll usually let our, our clients know, um, and they have a good idea of when we file the petition. And I try to let them know what to expect after we file the, the petition. Um, from that point, when we file everything else, uh, we file a statement of completion. And the, the case is still in the, the pre-assignment review process during that point. And um, so from the moment we file the petition until it gets assigned out of the PAR can take anywhere from uh, three to six months, assuming we, we filed everything we need to file. Once it gets assigned out of the PAR, uh, we'll notify the client and let them know that we're going to uh, be asked to make a settlement demand. And so I uh, tend to, to discuss with my clients you know, what I would request in, in the settlement demand based on the facts of your case, um, you know, get your input on, on you know, the value of the case. Again, these settlement demands that we send at this point um, do, do not or rarely result in fruitful discussions. But um, so because of that, I, I always ask for full value. You know, I'm not going to start off asking for a discount uh, case. So, but um, you'll know when your case is out of the par when we start discussing that, that point, that, uh, that settlement demand. Okay, so Barbara asks if there's a, a spot for me to check what has and hasn't been received. <clears throat> um, I, I don't know if 
you're referring to the par form or if there's um, something else that you're hoping to, to check off. Um, but if we include a medical provider on the par form, um, then that means you know we, we've gone out and gotten those records. So any, any provider that's not on the par form um, that falls within that window, whether it's pre-vaccination, post-vaccination, um, you know, let us know via email, phone, call, uh, so that we know to go get those records. Uh, Vince Plunkett asks if um, medical improvement and conditions over the year have any impact on compensation. So damages obviously includes any uh, pain and suffering during um, uh, the, the treatment for your injury immediately after all the way up through the point of what we call maximum medical improvement. So at, at the time that we resolve cases, most of the time, the, the client will be uh, done with treatment. They have, will have reached the point of their maximum medical improvement. There's no other, no more therapy, no more other treatments that, that they can do that would improve their symptoms. So at that point, we know what we're talking about is, is past medical uh, expenses, past lost wages or earnings, past pain and suffering damages. And, and that's for the severity of, of your symptoms from day one all the way up to um, you know, what your maximum medical improvement was. Now, if, if your condition improves over time, um, you know, that will factor into the, the damages that, that you would get. But um, if you have any residual symptoms, even after your maximum medical improvement, we can ask for future pain and suffering based on that. So, you know, for if we take a, a serva case as, as an example, you know, you have a shoulder surgery, you have therapy to recover from that surgery, and even after all that therapy, you still have some some um, restrictions in your range of motion or pain. But it's, it's it's time for us to resolve your case. Then you know our demand would include any uh, compensation for future pain and suffering as well. And then um, you know obviously the the, the respondent is going to look at you know, your condition over time, and um, if you have a full recovery, let's say, they're going to obviously use that as a factor to to try and limit your compensation. But that doesn't take away you know, the fact that you went through significant pain and suffering for, you know, six months, eight months, 12 months, even though you made a full recovery. So, uh, you know, we, you don't get, uh, you know, any less compensation for that period of time just because you have a full recovery. Uh, Barbara asks, I'd like to see the records uh, before you file the petition so I don't miss anything. Uh, yes. So, um, like I said, you know, we get the petition ready and we get um, all of your, your records. And then we, we use the records uh, to include citations in the petition. So, when we file the petition, uh, we want to have all the records that we need, have all, all the things that we want to file with the petition. We want it ready when we file the petition. So, You'll, you'll have a, a review of the PAR form at that point to make sure we're not missing anything. Okay, um, got another question here. What is considered a full recovery? Uh, so the way I like to consider a full recovery is, you know, the day before you went in for this vaccination, however you were feeling that day, if you're not back to that point, then you're not fully recovered. So, um, you know, if, what the core or what, what, the respondent, uh, their their view of a full recovery is, is different than mine. Um, you know, they base it on medical records. So if you get to a point where you're not treating anymore for this, uh, they're going to try to use that to say that you've you've made a full recovery, you're, you're not needing any more treatment. Um, we all know that, you know, just because you don't go to therapy every day, 
doesn't mean you're you're not living with this this injury. So um, that's how I look at it. Had this had you never got this vaccine, you know what whatever you're feeling like that day, um, and until you get back to that point, you're not 100% recovered. Are there any other uh, questions about this um, topic? Not seeing any others in the, the chat. Um, so what I'd like to do just to close real quick, um, you know, I want to thank everybody for joining today. We're going to try and do this on a, a quarterly basis. Um, so we'll have another webinar here before uh, the midway point of the year. And you know, what what I wanted to do was invite our our clients to actually um, you know offer topic suggestions. You know, what, what is it that you want to know about you know, you know this program, about a particular vaccine or vaccine injury. Um, you know, maybe uh, what you want to know about us or our firm. Um, and we'll try to incorporate those into our future webinars. Um, you know, I know for a while, COVID vaccines were, were, were a hot topic. Um, and, you know, obviously we're, we're monitoring that situation very closely. Fortunately, there isn't much of an update um, from last year. You know, there isn't... Um, you know, significant movement right now to to add COVID vaccines to the vaccine injury compensation program. The the legislation that was proposed last last year uh, to to make it easier to add COVID vaccines to the program. Uh, there hasn't been any movement since last year on that legislation, so kind of in a holding pattern for that um, right now. But obviously, if there's any news on that front, we we will uh, we'll update you. Um, then I'd, I'd uh, invite anybody um, who doesn't have a, a copy of my book yet to um, send us a message and, and ask for one. We'll, we'll get one out to you um, for free. We'll, we'll send one out to you. Just give us your, your mailing address and, and we'll send that one out to you. Um, then finally, you know, we will be posting this on our, our YouTube channel. Um, and uh, it should be up by tomorrow at some point. So. We'll be able to, to revisit this if you want to. Um, you know, if you want to leave a question in the comments, uh, feel free. We'll try and address those. Um, and then, you know, there's some other content on that on that channel um, you know, about uh, you know, our our firm about vaccine injuries um, that I invite you to to check out. Or better yet, uh, you could subscribe to the channel so you uh, you don't miss anything else. So, um, well, thank you everybody for joining. Uh, sorry, it went a little longer than 45 minutes, but um, please uh, reach out to me if you ever have any questions um, or if you just want to chat, uh, I'd be happy to hear from you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>